All right, and welcome back to Mr. Gregoris Math. Uh, we're taking a look today at volumes of revolutions. So uh, I have here a cone, and actually it's one of the previous cones you've seen. Uh, it splits off into all the conic sections. It's a layover from one of the excellent math teachers here uh, at Chippewa who left it behind. And so I'm glad to use it as a prop today. Um, we all know the formula for the volume of a cone, right? The volume of a cone is equal to one third pi r squared times height. Um, but if we actually care about where the volume of a cone formula came from, we may have to go back to that grade nine class um, where you probably took a look at the shape that contained the cone, the cylinder. And you might recall seeing a picture like this where you had a cylinder and you found the size of, or the volume of the cylinder, perhaps you even filled it with something, like maybe you filled it with water or rice or something like that. And then your teacher had you pour it out into another cone and you checked to see how many times it filled up. And you said, well, if I had a cone that had the exact same height and the exact same base, then the volume of this inner cone was exactly one third of that cylinder's height. And you probably recall that lesson from way back when in grade nine. Um, but that's the only way to prove the formula for the volume of a cone. So this is going to be our end goal for this particular part of the lesson, and then we'll take a look at what happens when we have to remove an intersection in a volume of revolution. But we'll start off first dealing with this as our volume of revolution. So uh, we're going to consider this cone, but we're going to look at it not in three dimensions. Through the magic of cameras, we're going to look at this in just simply two dimensions. So I tilted this cone sideways so that it sits on the x-axis. So I'm just gonna go ahead and draw a set of axes here and sit my cone down on it. So there's my x-axis, there's my y-axis, and here's my cone. Now I have the choice of sitting my cone here or here or like this. Although that's kind of silly because that's not going to be the, the shape I'm looking for. Um, or I can sit my cone like this as well too. And I'm hoping that I can keep the base uh, parallel to, or sorry, perpendicular to, uh, I guess on the same plane as what the Y plane would be in three space. And I want the height to follow along my X axis. So what shape does the cone actually construct? When I do this, it looks like it's going to form an isosceles triangle. So I'm going to remove my cone after making a couple of markings here. And I'm going to draw the shadow of my cone in place. So um, I apologize for the interruption. I'll try to go back and cut that out. Um, so I've got my shadow of my cone here resting on the plane and you can see that I've done one side of it in one color and then the other side in another color. And there's a very good reason for this. The reason is this cone is actually constructed by taking this top triangle and rotating it around the x-axis. You can imagine the x-axis as being that pivot point that goes through the tip of the cone all the way through the base of the cone. And then that triangle would be just one portion of it and it gets revolved around the x-axis like so. And so as it gets revolved, it cuts space into the plane and creates the actual volume of that cone. So uh, we've got our cone, we've got that top leading edge. The problem is, well, what if I have a bottom leading edge there as well too? You may recall from integration and integration of spaces in two dimensions that the integral above here is going to be positive, whereas the integral below here is going to be negative. So if I rotate this one, I'm going to construct the positive volume of the cone. And if I rotate this one, I'm going to construct the negative volume of the cone. And the problem there is going to be the positive and negative volumes will cancel each other out. And this cone, which is very real and exists, will be said to have a volume of zero. So, for that reason, I'm only going to use one side of the profile, which restricts actually pretty seriously the amount of stuff that I can do with this technique of volumes of revolutions. Because now, my materials that I'm revolving need to be symmetrical, because I have to have at least the profile of them so that it can be modeled with a center line on the x-axis. So that's an important caveat for some of the questions that we're going to see with this work. 
is that we expect these to be symmetrical items that are centered on the x-axis. So now let's get down to the tax of the integration and how this all works. First, we need some measurements. Well, the length of the cone, the length of the cone was its height. So let's make a mark there at H. And the height of the triangle was the radius of the cone. So we'll make a mark for R. I guess that's our R value all the way up here. So really, what we need to do is we need to find the area of this revolution and rotate it around to find the volume. Now what's happening here is we need to come up with a formula that gives us the heights all the way along this. Now, I've gone back to a little bit of a grade nine throwback because this formula is in fact just a line. So we're gonna have a pretty easy problem here. But what it's gonna do is it's going to give us these little slices. And you may recall these when we were examining the actual area of the integral. Sorry, I'm just gonna pause so I can go and close the door on people. I'll have to do some back end editing on this, I think. So if you recall, we had taken little slices of things when we were developing that whole concept of integration in the first place. These were like our little kind of like, our, our sum of all of these rectangles were our left-handed and right-handed sums. And we added all of these sums up and uh, we got to the area. But this was just like a very, very small area and if I instead don't look at just one of these, I say, okay, what if I built a disc on here? So if I take this portion and I turn it so that my x-axis is going into the board, then what I've got is I've actually got a radius. And that radius is the thing that's being revolved around. And so what I'm gonna need to do is I'm gonna need to add up all of these discs which will be these slices out of my cone at particular spots. And if I add up all of those discs, then what I'll do is I'll actually calculate the volume of this figure. So this is nice because then that means if I can model the profile of the shape, I can figure out the size of all of these discs. And now it doesn't matter whether I'm dealing with a cone, whether I'm dealing with a cylinder, or whether I'm dealing with that ridiculous porcelain a uh, vase that's sitting there holding flowers from Mother's Day still. So just as so long as I can model the profile and come up with an equation for the profile, then I can find the area of all of these little disks that I can then add up to, uh, to find the volume. So how do I find these disks? Well, I need to find the equation for R, and then remember the formula for the area of a disk or a circle is area equals pi R squared. So I'm gonna to have to add together infinitely many pi r squares. That's where I'm gonna need an integral. And I'm gonna to have to do that from zero to h. Those are gonna be my limits of integration. And I suppose I'm gonna to need to have uh, that equation for that radius in terms of y and x. So uh, let's go through our parts first by one, defining the profile. So this is just a line that goes from zero R, so it's, uh, its y-intercept is R, and its slope is negative R, and its run is H. So it's going to be the line Y equals negative R over H, X plus R. Please take a second now, pause the video to make sure you're okay with how quickly I got that, and to make sure that I got that correct. So that's the profile of our line. And R and H here are just constants that are relative to this particular cone. So if I had a specific cone with measurements, or if I took a ruler and measured these, these would be numbers. Um, now, the next thing I have to do is I have to find my boundaries. Very often, the boundaries of your integration are pretty easy to see from your picture. I'm gonna integrate from zero all the way to h because I'm going to add up all of these little disks the entire way along. So my limits of integration or my boundaries are going to be from 0 to h. And then step 3, I'm going to integrate 
the disks. Now here's where there's a little switch. Y represents the height of this line above the x-axis. So Y is actually the radius of each of these disks as we move along. So when I integrate the disks, I'm going to be integrating from 0 to h of pi y squared dx. Because I'm taking all of those heights and they become my radiuses. And I'm integrating it with respect to x because I'm on the xy plane. And I'm starting at 0 and going to h because that's where my cone is defined. Now. Obviously, y doesn't integrate with respect to x nicely, it's just treated as a constant, but we have an equation for y in terms of x. So now I'm going to erase my picture and continue my work right here. So I'll leave these side things up. Uh, just, you probably have this picture, you can go back and take a look. So we'll just copy and paste this integral up to the top, and we go from zero to h of pi y squared dx. Now that's going to be in equal to the integral from 0 to h of pi, and y squared is going to be negative r over h x plus r squared dx. So I'm replacing y with its value, and I'm squaring it, because it's the radius of the circle. I'm going to go ahead and remove my pi, because this is just a constant, so I can pull that constant out, and I don't have to deal with it. Uh, at least not for now. So I have from zero to h of this particular uh, function. Now, it makes sense to go ahead and compute that squaring. So I'll square this binomial rather quickly. You square the first term, r squared over h squared times x squared. Then we double the product. So the product is r squared over h x, but it's negative, so minus two r squared over h x. And then we'll square the last one, so plus r squared dx. Now I'm going to erase these components here so that I'm not confusing us with all the rest of the room. Now I have to integrate this, and you might be looking at it going, oh my god, this is going to be so tough to integrate. But it's actually not that challenging. The reason why it's not challenging is because we're integrating with respect to x. This is a constant. This is a degree 1. This is a degree 2. So it shouldn't be too challenging for us to work through. So my integral, this is going to increase to a 3. I'm going to divide by a 3. Hmm, I wonder if that has anything to do with the 1 third pi uh, squared. Then, uh, yeah, so I'll have r squared over h squared, my constant. This will be x now cubed. And I have to remember to divide by 3 because I've increased the exponent of when integrating. Uh, now, I'll increase this exponent, which was a 1, to become a 2. So this would be minus 2r squared over h. That's just the constant. This would be x to the power of 2. But now I have to divide by 2. Nicely, it looks like those are going to cancel out. And then this is just r squared. So this is going to be r squared x. And so I've gone ahead and evaluated that integral. Sorry, rather, I've gone ahead and performed the integration. I haven't evaluated yet because I still have to substitute in values of h and 0. So where am I substituting in these values of h and 0? Well, I'm substituting in h for x, and then on my next run through, I'm going to substitute in 0 for x. The nice part about substituting in 0 is every term contains an x, so really, I'm not going to be subtracting a portion afterwards. So all I'm going to have to worry about is this substitution of h. So let's go ahead and do that substitution of h. So I have r squared over 3h squared. Now x cubed is now h cubed minus, remember those twos cancel. So we have r squared over h. x squared is now h squared. And then we have plus r squared h. Now this is the part where I would subtract substituting in 0, but I would just be subtracting 0 minus 0 minus 0. I should be 0 plus 0 minus 0. But, I mean, adding and subtracting zeros is kind of a waste of time. So we'll leave that like that. Now we can simplify a bit. These two h's cancel with two of those. This h cancels with one of those. And you'll notice that all of my terms now are r squared h's. So I have an r squared h, an r squared h, and an r squared h. 
Nicely enough, take a look at these two. This is negative r squared h and positive r squared h. Those will simply cancel. And I'll be left with, hold on a second, pi r squared h over three. Pi r squared h over three. Is that not the same as the formula for the volume of the cone? I believe it is. So this is how the uh, volume of revolution can be used to help us change that line that defined the profile of a cone to the equation for the volume of a cone. You can do this for all shapes. So just as long as you can define that profile by some function and apply this formula, you can go ahead and do that uh, for any figure. This gets particularly interesting when your shape goes above and below the x-axis. Because and now that I've gotten through that, I'm just going to erase this and draw a neater profile. So suppose my x-axis is here and my profile function looks like this. Well, when I rotate this profile function, maybe I'm going to rotate from this point all the way up to this point. So from zero to B. This section is going to carve out kind of a, a weird top looking thing. Then it's going to cinch down to a point where it's very, very narrow. Like it's only connected by a single strand. And this negative portion is actually going to create a whole negative portion above. But remember in the formula, we're squaring things. So when we square a negative, it's going to become a positive space as well. So regardless of whether this is above or below, it's going to create a positive volume. And it would give you that volume of, I guess it would look kind of like this. It would be like a, a bulbous sort of snowman thing. But then you have to consider that it has like three dimensional space here. So it's like a weird balloon animal. I don't know why I'm drawing it like that, but just imagine that in three dimensions and uh, this would create uh, what that might look like. Um, so even if our function goes below the x-axis, we can still use it as our profile function for um, finding the volumes of revolutions. On our next video, we'll take a look at what happens when we compare uh, volumes of revolutions of two functions. So if we have a function that binds the top and the bottom, kind of like when we did areas between curves in our last integration unit. See us next time on Mr. Gregorius Math. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe and uh, ring that notification bell and check the shop for merch.